Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to the course Introduction to the Psychology of Bilingualism and Multilingualism. I am Dr. Ark Verma from the Department of Cognitive Sciences at IIT Kanpur and in this course I am going to talk to you about various aspects of being a bilingual or a multilingual and basically what does it entail to sort of learn, acquire, use uh, more than one language. We will talk about the neural consequences, the cognitive consequences, the sociological consequences for example of what it means to be a bilingualism and we will study this phenomena from various disciplinary perspectives. In the previous lecture I talked to you a little bit about some of the conceptual issues of bilingualism, some of the distributions of the landscape of bilingualism and in this particular lecture I will continue that discussion uh, into what does it mean to be a bilingual alright and what are the different aspects in understanding who is a bilingual and who is not. Now one of the very important factors when we talk about bilingualism is this variable or is this aspect called proficiency. You may ask what is proficiency? Proficiency typically is how well uh, is uh, or let us say what is the relative ability of an individual to speak in a given language. Are you let us say on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, are you comfortable in speaking English at the scale of 1 to 10 uh, at the level of 9 or 10, maybe 8, 8.5 uh, or let us say uh, you know. Uh, are you very good in writing uh, something? Are you very good in understanding something? Can we rate proficiency proficiency differently for different skills? So for example, can we say that oh, uh, when it comes to English, I am very good in understanding, let us say at the level of 9 or 10, but I am not very good in writing. If, if you ask me to write a, an essay, I will probably write to the best of around 4 or 5 on a scale of 1 to 10. So is it possible that people have different levels of proficiency uh, for different skills related to each language? And if that is the case, uh, can we call these people or can we call ourselves proper bilinguals? And again, proper is a term that I am using not to, uh, you know, uh, in some sense uh, not to uh, say that the others are not proper bilinguals or some people are better bilinguals than others but then these are disciplinary considerations that come into place when you, st uh, when you start uh, to study these people. When you uh, bring them to your lab and you want to do a particular experiment in bilingualism, you would want to know that how proficient is this person in this second language that we are going to test. And this has been something that has plagued researchers of bilingualism a lot. People uh, who work with bilinguals in their labs, people who conduct different kinds of experiments with bilinguals need to know exactly how proficient an individual is in the second language that they are being tested in. And that is something very, very important. And if you ask people, say for example, something that I have uh, also personally uh, struggled with uh, because I do some research in bilingualism. Uh, when you talk about, uh, you know, when you call people to your lab and you say, oh, uh, are you a bilingual, are you not? And if, if this is a single question, everybody is a bilingual. Everybody says that I know more than one language. That is perfectly all right. But if you ask them, how proficient are you in English? All right, because I, I live in Kanpur I, and this is the, the uh, part of the country, although I, I am, uh, you know, uh, living and studying and, and teaching in IIT Kanpur, uh, it is a fairly cosmopolitan population that people know several languages. But uh, for uh, example sake, uh, if my research uh, focuses on Hindi English bilinguals, so when I call people to my lab and I ask them that, oh, uh, how proficient are you in English? And typically, invariably, everybody would say, oh, I am very, very good. I uh, am, uh, let us say, uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, you can rate me a 9, you can rate me a 10. And what I have understood uh, over time about these people when we do experiments with them, when we analyze their data in the second language, when we sort of uh, give them tests of language uh, proficiency of a language that they have said that, oh, I am super good in, uh, in, in that language, is that people uh, uh, 
very significantly overestimate their proficiencies in, in a given language. Uh, people do not a lot of times understand uh, what does it formally uh, mean uh, to know that language. Say for example, everybody uh, would say that I understand English very well, but if I give you a bunch of sentences uh, in slightly incorrect English grammar and I ask you to correct them, I am sure a bunch of you would be scratching your heads and you will say, oh, uh, I am good, but this is probably not something that I can do. So, people generally overestimate their proficiency in a given skill uh, or uh, you know for most of the linguistic prowess when it comes to languages that they have been around with. For example, I was telling in the last lecture that I understand a little bit of Urdu. I do listen to ghazals, I do listen to Urdu poetry, but if you really uh, you know put me to test and if you start asking uh, you know proper uh, uh, meanings of Urdu words, although I would uh, probably have a sense that I understood that word, but if somebody turns around and asks me that, oh, can you tell me what is the meaning of this particular word in this ghazal, and I will, as I said, be scratching my head and say, oh, I, I think it means this, but I am not very confident. And this is something very interesting because, as I mentioned in research studies, when we want a more definitive uh, understanding of somebody's proficiency, it becomes a bit of a problem because people typically overestimate their proficiency in a given language. And when you start testing them with more formal measures, with tests of uh, more formal kind, uh, whether be it a test in reading, whether be it a test in writing, whether be it a test in even listening uh, or, and understanding and answering questions after uh, listening to a particular passage, uh, there is a difference that we see. Uh, people uh, do, as I said, overestimate initially when you ask them. Uh, when you test them, sometimes you will find that there is a difference of maybe 20 percent, maybe 30 percent in a lot of cases. So, proficiency is something that is, uh, is, uh, is a very important factor when it comes to bilingualism research and my sense is it's, it's, it's uh, personally uh, you know my experience and I'm sure uh, a lot of other researchers would share this is that uh, people give a rather inflated sense of their proficiency in a given language when you test them using a lot of these scales. Say for example, if I ask you on a scale of 1 to 10 how proficient you are in English, I am sure that maybe you will overestimate yourself by 10% and it's, it's not saying that everybody does that, but a lot of us do that. All right. Now consequently what happens is more recent research has slightly changed its strategy. Uh, in, in more recent times, what people are looking at and say for example, researchers like myself are looking at using more objective measures of proficiency. What we are trying to do is we are trying to test people in their second language or in their third language depending upon whatever the research question is uh, by relying more upon objective measures of language proficiency. What are, what are objective measures you might ask? And objective measures would look something like that I will give you a list of words and I will basically ask you to tell me whether you know the meaning of these words or not. Maybe I might ask you to write a one line meaning of that word as well. Maybe I will give you a passage to translate translate from Hindi to English if I am testing you in English and translate it back from English to Hindi. Maybe I will give you a passage in English and I will ask you 5, 6, 10 questions related to that passage and on the basis of how good or accurate your answers are, I will give you a particular score and understand that okay, this is your exact and unadulterated, non-inflated measure of proficiency in that language. All right. So, proficiency is, is, is in some sense a very interesting factor that uh, researchers of bilingualism grapple with uh, day in and day out. Now, there are other interesting questions that can be asked about proficiency. For example, uh, whether it is actually possible for an individual, a bilingual or a multilingual individual that is, uh, to be equally proficient in both languages. Uh, if you ask me, I would probably say that maybe I am equally proficient in Hindi and English having gone to an English medium school uh, since my childhood to 2.53 years of age that is. Uh, so I have had enough experience of speaking in English. Uh, I have probably an equal experience of speaking in Hindi and although Hindi is my native language, I might be biased to say oh I know Hindi and English equally. But again if you test me uh, using uh, you know equally. Uh, hard objective measures of proficiency, I am not very sure how, will, how I will score in them. Actually, I am not even sure how I will score in uh, objective measures of Hindi proficiency even because a lot of times uh, the proficiency of an individual in a given language depends upon how much 
and in what instances, in what particular situations you have been using and interacting in that language. So, for example, I do not interact in official Hindi, in, uh, you know, in, in, in a sense that say for example, uh, court proceedings would do or say for example, parliamentary uh, Hindi or for example, uh, official, uh, you know, Hindi. I, I speak in more what the Kadiboli sort of uh, language is. So, is it, is it actually possible that people can be equally uh, proficient in both languages? Again, is a question that I leave you to, uh, you know, uh, think about, discuss amongst yourself and maybe uh, come up with an answer. Uh, also, is it required that people be equally proficient uh, for using a given language in all different modalities? Say for example, if I say that I am a bilingual, uh, is, it po is it necessary that I be equally good in uh, uh, you know listening to Hindi, in reading uh, or uh, listening to English, in reading English, in writing English and speaking English? So, there are these four modalities that we talk about. Is it uh, perfectly necessary that I am equally proficient in all of these four skills for myself to be called a Hindi English bilingual? Again, a question that uh, you know uh, is, is relevant not in the general sense of the word because people get by and it is typically not a problem, but it is a problem that psycholinguists uh, do grapple with when they are designing experiments, when they are uh, working with people who they deem bilinguals, but then it turns out that, oh, this person cannot read and understand uh, uh, the language, but can speak it uh, uh, with a relative degree of proficiency. And, uh, uh, you know, when you talk to them, they, they can make conversational sense of the language. Again, these are a couple of questions which are intriguing and they become very, very important when you talk about research in bilingualism. They are not very important in the general communicative efficiency sense of the word, but they become very, very important when you talk about the research in bilingualism. Now, for the longest time it was believed, it was traditionally believed that learning and using two languages would actually be detrimental to the development of children's linguistic and cognitive uh, performance. So a, a lot of people, and I remember uh, 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 reading it somewhere, that a lot of people in, in uh, you know, olden days uh, used to discourage people to, uh, from becoming bilingualism. And the, and the uh, you know, common refrain would be that if you try and learn two languages or three languages all at once, you will probably not be good in either of the three. I mean, it's it's typically, uh, uh, and you might have heard this, that a bilingual is half of a, a L1 person and half of an L2 person, but uh, neither a fully language one person, neither a fully la uh, uh, language two person. Uh, I should probably explain what L1 and L2 mean. Uh, Typically, when you're talking about L1, you're talking about the native language, the mother tongue of an individual, and L2 can be the second language that they learn, L3 can be the third language, L4, and so on and so forth. So, uh, it was believed that, you know, uh, a bilingual is half of an L1 and half of an L2 person, but neither fully an L1 person nor fully an L2 person. Interestingly, Peel and Lambert in 1962 first demonstrated that bilingual children had actually a bit of an advantage over monolingual children, both in terms of verbal and nonverbal intelligence. So back in 1962, I think this was done on a bunch of immigrant children, if I remember the experiment correctly, and what, the, what was done was these children were tested in their second language. I think these, these were Korean English uh, uh, immigrants and, uh, you know, uh, I may stand corrected if I am uh, recalling this incorrectly. Uh, but these children were tested in the second language and given that these children spoke two languages relatively better uh, and they were compared to only monolingual uh, uh, speakers of a given language, maybe it be monolingual Korean speakers or monolingual English speakers, uh, it was found that these bilingual children actually outperformed the monolingual children in verbal uh, tasks as well as non-verbal tasks, in tasks that require language and in also tasks that require and that do not require language in general intelligence so to speak and that started uh, a, a huge, you know, it's, it's been uh, 60 years uh, uh, almost and there has been a large body of research, there has been a very large body of research that has dedicated itself to investigating and understanding the advantages linked to bilingualism. And there is a sense that bilingualism or, uh, uh, you know, having the knowledge of uh, more than one language 
is advantages uh, not only in the communicative sense of the word it does not make you only uh, better in communicating with different kinds of people but it does make you more intelligent in some ways it does make you better in handling multiple tasks at once it probably uh, uh, you know and there there was some research that suggested that it makes uh, you uh, you know it makes uh, for a delay in setting of alzheimers and dementia and this and that and there is there is a lot of literature we'll come to come back to that at some point in time so uh, and different kinds of researchers have sort of variously qualified the discussion uh, about uh, you know who are bilinguals and uh, you know uh, what is it uh, uh, what is it that is the ideal definition of bilingualism uh, who should be kept in this box that we are calling bilingualism and who should be kept out of it and there are some examples for example bloomfield says uh, and defines bilingualism as native like control of two languages now again uh, what is native like is probably subjective uh, what is native like is probably uh, saying that oh it must be something like you were born to let us say english speaking parents if you are talking about uh, english bilingualism uh, hindi english bilingualism or tamil speaking parents and, and so on and so forth uh, Hogan, for example, uh, suggests that the expansion of the linguistic repertoire of a bilingual individual expands through the ability to produce complete and meaningful utterances in the second language. Now, while this sounds a little bit more complicated than Bloomfield's idea, it is probably a slightly watered down version. In some sense, we are basically saying as long as this individual uh, in question can produce meaningful utterances in the second language say for example if i can produce five six sentences in english i qualify to be called a bilingual now you will understand that this is a relatively uh, lower bar or a relatively easy classification because if you take this second one almost everybody can be classified as a bilingual and why not all right now uh, again as i said uh, as researchers uh, when we sort of look at this we understand that the matters of proficiency are more complex it needs a, a more a fine grained understanding uh, and they, it, they are more complex and they, they basically needs to assess abilities across the four modalities that we discuss say for example uh, it uh, maybe people need to be tested uh, differently for their listening skills for their uh, uh, speaking skills writing skills and reading skills in a given language uh, and also the quality of the language that they have say for example uh, if you see any test of let's say for example some of you students might be giving the ielts or the toefls and so on uh, you would see that people would want to test you on the quality of the language that you have as well uh, people would want to test you say for example on your vocabulary uh, of a second or a third language they would want to test you how grammatically correct you are when you create these utterances that hogan talks about and also in some cases pronunciation in schools convent schools more specifically and most english speaking schools uh, if i may say so also uh, you know place a particular emphasis on correct pronunciation you know you should not be uh, merely knowing how to sort of speak uh, you may also uh, be knowing uh, you know uh, to speak them correctly uh, and it's sometimes taken as a matter of pride that you know in in, in elocution competitions for example in uh, poetry recital competitions for example that oh the pronunciation was superb it was more like uh, you know an englishman uh, speaking it so that is also something uh, you know very interesting and probably needs to be considered when we are talking about proficiency and again uh, remember that when we are talking about proficiency it can be for different purposes we can be talking about proficiency just for communicative efficiency sake and then probably everything goes but when you are talking about proficiency in more uh, of a research setting in classifying somebody as a bilingual and then uh, uh, you know asking them to do a bunch of cognitive tasks then the measures that you will use and the qualification criteria that you will use for uh, you know deeming somebody as a bilingual will be very different now as i said earlier different types of tests have been used to measure proficiency of individuals uh, in their uh, you know across their known languages and across these different modalities for instance rating scales uh, have been most commonly used uh, rating scales uh, uh, and tests of fluency flexibility uh, whether english is your dominant language hindi is your dominant language and the most common measure 
uh, across these different kinds of tests of proficiencies that typically have been used have been these rating scales. And as I began this, uh, you know, lecture with, uh, typically what we have been doing and what a lot of researchers has been doing, although now people are shifting away from the strategy. Uh, when I was a student, typically what you would do is you would uh, basically give your participants a language background questionnaire or a self-rated proficiency questionnaire where there will be questions uh, like that on a scale of 1 to 5, how proficient uh, are you in speaking Hindi uh, or speaking English for that matter, where 1 is least proficient and 5 is most proficient. And basically you would do this uh, for different skills. You would do this uh, for uh, say for example uh, speaking, you will do this for uh, reading, you will do this for writing and you will do this for comprehension. And you will ask these people who will come to your lab and you will say, okay, uh, on a scale of 1 to 5 given these uh, skills, uh, how proficient do you consider yourself to be? Uh, you know, are you at, at the level of 5, are you at the level of uh, 1, are you somewhere in the middle of 3 and then people have sort of used different variations of these scales. So these are called Likert scales, people of social sciences would know this and these Likert scales could have different resolutions. You can have a, a 5 point rating scale, you could have a 7 point rating scale, you could have an 11 point rating scale but all of this uh, basically depends upon a particular assumption. And it's interesting that this assumption uh, uh, is, is the governing assumption, but a lot of times it could be something that, you know, you are not very sure of. Say, for example, uh, it depends upon the assumption that people uh, are going to honestly respond to this. Uh, people are going to uh, tell you exactly that, oh, I am proficient in English, let us say on a 10 point scale up to the level of 6 or up to the level of 7 and so that they can maybe uh, they can be adequately categorized into groups uh, uh, you know concerning your particular research question now this is interesting and again uh, i'm not saying that people are not honest uh, people may be honest in some cases uh, and i've ha i've had this experience when i was uh, studying in uh, in the university of allahabad uh, and this is a personal anecdote to share here uh, that when we wanted to conduct experiments uh, in Hindi English bilinguals with Hindi English bilinguals and I would uh, call people to the lab and I will ask them oh uh, how proficient are you in English and they would say oh I am uh, you know on a scale of 1 to 10 I am an 8 or I am a 9 uh, and when we would uh, run a different test and we would tell them that okay uh, maybe you are not really 9 or 8 you are probably more like a 4. Uh, more like a 5 and that people would get offended and say oh how dare you classify me as a low profession bilingual I am studying in an English medium uh, course and I am uh, you know good and this and that and so on. So uh, what it sort of led us to discover is sometimes uh, even though they are trying to be uh, well meaning and honest. Uh, and this is what I started the discussion with, people do not have the best idea of their proficiency in a given language. People do uh, overestimate themselves or their proficiency in a given language and that sort of becomes a limiting factor uh, when you are using mainly these scales for uh, testing and classifying and categorizing bilinguals into different categories. That is why people have, researchers have actually, turned to more objective measures of proficiency which again also are far from perfect. Say for example, uh, somebody who works in an office that uses both Hindi and English and I give them a translation test, I am sure they would do very well at it. But are they as good in English for example because that is what I am testing, are they as good an English speaker that can write a poem in English, an original piece in English, that can write a flawless prose in English. Now, Again, these are objective, uh, these are subjective, uh, you know, judgments that you would make, but you sort of convert those subjective decisions to scoring sheets and it becomes objective. So, uh, what I'm trying to say here is uh, self rating measures are far from perfect given because uh, A, sometimes people have the prof uh, have the tendency to not be honest because they don't want to be categorized in the lower strata of proficiency of a given language. But a lot of times and that happens much more that they are not really aware, they overestimate their proficiency in a given language. So, so, so subjective measures, testing scales, etc. may not be the best way to classify or categorize somebody as a bilingual. But the objective measures available and my lab is sort of working and a lot of labs around India and the world are working 
in uh, creating some of these measures, uh, creating objective measures of proficiency of language. It is very, very important that we have a good idea of uh, who uh, we categorize as a bilingual and in what context. And for that, again, it is a circular discussion because then we need to also go back to more basic questions as to who do you want to categorize as a bilingual. Do you want to categorize somebody as a bilingual uh, even if they do not write in that language or read in that language but can speak and understand very well? So these are some of the questions that again are food for thought and they will keep coming up because I plan to discuss a lot of experiments when we go ahead. I plan to discuss a lot of experiments uh, when we uh, study various aspects of bilingualism and you will see in most of those experiments what people have done is that they have relied on some measure of proficiency before calling individuals bilingual. That is something that we will uh, study again in a lot of detail as we go ahead. Now, another associated problem of trying to understand uh, the different types of bilinguals is the categories you would divide them to. How would you put people into different categories? Uh, what kind of labels would you give them? And again, uh, and this is typical of scientists that there is little agreement among researchers. There is a uh, little unanimous uh, sense of, uh, you know, who uh, to classify as a bilingual, what are the classifications that you would put bilinguals into? And as I said, uh, you know, you, you continuously keep revisiting the basic definitions of bilingualism. You continuously keep revisiting the basic definitions of proficiency. And that is a debate that goes on and on and on. All right. So, uh, there is there is a lot of variation. There is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, non homogeneousness in how and uh, you know what kind of labels we categorize our bilinguals into. Now, the and also if you look at bilinguals, if you look at the variables attached to the bilinguals, there are simply many, many variables. Say, for example, you can talk about bilinguals from the perspective of age, the age at which somebody acquired a second or a third language. And biologically, it also makes sense. Say, for example, people who have picked up a second or a third language at a much earlier age uh, turns out to be more proficient in that language if they have continued using that, by the way. Uh, than somebody who has learned a particular language at a very later age. Say, for example, somebody migrated to the United States of America at the age of 45 uh, and has picked up some English and you're testing them at the age of 55 and so on. They still have had 10 years of experience with English. But are they going to be as good in English uh, as somebody who was born and brought up in, uh, in, in America for that matter? gender, intelligence, uh, memory, uh, attitudes towards the language. As I said that in, in certain parts of the country, uh, it is considered a matter of prestige. It is considered a matter of self-esteem to be very good in English. It, it is almost taken as, uh, uh, you know, a mark of coming from a higher socioeconomic strata that I know, uh, that I know and speak English very well, but I don't know and speak my native language as well. All right. Interlinguistic dis distances. Say, for example, people who uh, learn variations of uh, some of the South Indian languages or variations of some of the European languages, because those languages are slightly closer to each other than, say, for example, our Hindi and English. Uh, those are also factors that you need to consider. Uh, the context of testing, the context of learning uh, are also very, very important when you try and, uh, you know, test for uh, uh, aspects of bilingualism when you try and uh, categorize bilinguals into these different uh, you know boxes that uh, you know we are referring to several kinds of labels however have still emerged you know people do need to sort of operationalize and move ahead and therefore several types of labels have emerged uh, wherein you will see in different journal articles if you want to read some bilingualism research that oh uh, our participants were balanced bilinguals or our participants were ambilinguals or they were equilinguals in other terms and then you will scratch your head and, and uh, say that okay, uh, is the balanced bilingual the same as an equilingual or is the balanced bilingual is the same as an ambilingual and again if you really start digging deeper into this you will realize that these this landscape is, is far from perfect, the definitions are far from exclusive from each other. So all of that sort of really you know uh, uh, is, is, is not very very clear. Also, people have used terms like a receptive bilingual or a productive bilingual. Oh, I can understand the second language uh, or I can just speak the second language. I cannot speak, say, for example, a lot of people around you, if you see, uh, they will say, oh, I can understand some English when we, I am spoken to in English, but I cannot uh, produce a proper sentence in English. 
are they uh, bilinguals or are they not whether you would want to uh, classify them as bilinguals or not again and uh, this is also an important criteria that needs to be considered when especially when you're talking about research also there is this uh, a very interesting aspect of additive or subtractive tendency say for example when i learned english uh, did it add to my overall linguistic repertoire or did it take away some of the knowledge of hindi that i would have grabbed and filled that empty space with whatever uh, of english that i could learn is it a additive tendency is it a subtractive tendency does it is it better for both the languages it is is it worse for both the languages again are questions which are open for discussion and researchers sort of bang their heads with these questions every day now and then and you will see journal articles uh, on on both sides of the debate uh, you know rather frequently now how do individuals learn uh, uh, you know multiple languages and again this is something that we can uh, talk about in 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 a lot of detail individuals around the world have at least some level of linguistic competence uh, the beat individuals from europe or africas or closer to home say for example regions in the south of india northeast of india where people typically have a slightly broader linguistic repertoire all right so uh, how how do people do that there are also things like you know specific modes of learning language you know specific modes of second language acquisition did you learn it naturally at home did you learn uh, uh, using school based instruction mediums what how did you pick up a language eventually and you can sort of go back and wonder about yourselves as well in in this whole debate now interestingly researchers have highlighted the importance of factors such as adequate motivation when you're talking about older age people picking up a language people have talked about adequate motivation aptitude uh, aptitude is a very important variable do you have the aptitude to learn language i see a lot of people around me who can very easily speak in four five six languages who can very easily learn languages if you expose them to it i once met a driver uh, uh, you know a taxi driver in shillong who said that i speak 13 languages all right so the aptitude for picking up language some people cannot pick up a second or a third language even though they keep trying for it and they uh, sincerely put some effort into it also opportunity how many different languages are you exposed to on a daily basis uh, you know can you pick up those languages uh, nonchalantly uh, are you exposed to them on a regular basis that you can pick up these languages uh, do you have the opportunity of learning do you have say for example is, is it going to get a raise in your uh, uh, job profile and so on now again uh, one of the things that uh, you know we can talk about is that when somebody picks up a second language is it only the language that they are learning is it say for example when i learned english did it did i only learn the vocabulary of english or the syntax of english and basically what i eventually had was this ability to put together english words into english sentences or did i learn something more and peel and lambert if you remember that experiment that i was describing demonstrated that a learning a second language has consequences may have consequences for that matter uh more than just expansion of the linguistic repertoire it can have consequences for my general intelligence it can have consequences for my ability to do two or three tasks at the same time it can have consequences for my personality and this and that as well so uh, people have suggested that uh, you know uh, individuals uh learn much more than just the second language or the third language that they learn and this 1960s peel and lambert's experiment where they compared uh, uh you know 10 year old middle class french and english bilinguals i have uh, said korean english bilinguals in a uh, previous class so uh, please uh, correct that uh, uh, middle class french and english bilinguals and monolingual children and they actually found uh, that uh, the bilingual children perform their monolingual peers in both verbal and non verbal intelligence so bilingual bilingualism or being bilingual may have consequences uh, for a person's general intelligence as well but the relationship between uh, you know bilingualism and multilingualism and their intellectual development is is slightly more complex than that say for example uh, peel and lambert study participants were called balanced bilinguals now how balanced bilinguals does that generalize to all kinds of bilinguals does that not is a question that we can sort of you know talk about now uh, in more recent research and uh, uh, you know ellen bialystock from uh, you know canada uh, 
uh, has been uh, uh, working in this area for more than three decades now, uh, has proposed that bilingualism may be associated with improved cognitive functioning. It may be improved for, for example, bilingualism as I was saying may become more adept at handling complex stimuli, uh, doing multiple tasks at once and so on. And there is a lot of literature if you look at it, there is a lot of literature that says that oh, bilingualism has these and these advantages. Uh, Bates, for example, has also suggested that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, learning a couple of languages, three languages, for example, expands not only the linguistic and intellectual competence, but also has consequences such as a delayed onset of dementia or Alzheimer's disease. So this is again something that people have sort of proposed in the literature. There is uh, active research going on in, in this field and people have sort of talked about this every now and then. Now, other than say, for example, the advantages of bilingualism that uh, you know that uh, are cognitive consequences, there are obviously advantages with respect to their uh, overall linguistic profile as well. Say, for example, uh, being a bilingual, we can uh, smoothly a lot of times code switch. We can be talking in in English but switch into Hindi, talking in Hindi but switch into English, and we can do it, uh, uh, you know, uh, effortlessly. Uh, sometimes, but sometimes it becomes a problem. In early, in, in early say, say for example, when you are just picking up a second or a third language, uh, then you would also experience something like cross language interference. You will basically see that, oh, I wanted to speak this in English, but uh, somehow I cannot search for the English word of it and so I used Hindi there or I use Tamil there or Bangla there or any, any of those languages. So there are also several kinds of transfer effects that exist between languages, uh, between two or more languages of the individual and this has also been documented and researched upon. Now another very interesting aspect that we don't really touch a lot upon and maybe we'll, we'll try and do this uh, during, the, uh, during this course at some point is that language is deeply intertwined with the culture and the traditions of the individuals speaking that language. Language is also a matter of identity. I am a Hindi speaker, I belong to the Hindi speaking belt of North India and I certainly have some pride associated to being a native Hindi speaker. Similarly, a Bangla speaker will have certain pride and a certain uh, self-esteem uh, in being recognized as a Bangla speaker. Similarly, Tamil speakers, Telugu speakers, Kannada speakers or for example, you go to Europe, French speakers are known to have a lot of pride in their language. Italian speakers are known to have a lot of pride in uh, speaking, uh, you know, uh, in their language. And therefore, you sort of see that, okay, language is not merely just a tools of communication, but it also has consequences for an individual's identity, an individual's uh, sense of self that, oh, I belong to this group. By knowing and using this language, I share a certain degree of identity with the rest of the speakers of that language, with the culture that that language has developed in, with the traditions that that language imbibes. Uh, and this is something which is which has been uh, which is very important that people have talked about it. All right. So languages uh, with themselves bring a deep sense of belonging and identity. In fact, several states, if you see within India across uh, Europe, are formed across linguistic identity. They are formed uh, along linguistic identity. Say, for example, uh, the idea is that uh, you know France is a country of French-speaking people. Spain is a country of Spanish speaking people in, in, in some sense there, there are linguistic differences those linguistic differences feed into identity different identity differences and then people have formed nation states across those linguistic lines across the uh, lines of identity that were forged by the languages that they commonly spoke. So it has been opined that uh, to the degree of to the degree that bilinguals possess any given language, they do in in a some sense in limited sense maybe draw from the cultures and traditions that are embedded in that language. That's a very interesting question that I pose to you. Is that uh, given that I have, I am a proficient speaker of English, within quotes, uh, am I also like an Englishman? Do I also think like somebody who has been born and brought up in England? And this is a very, very interesting question. This is, this is something that I would leave you to ponder with. Do people, when they learn a second language, become party to that culture and their tradition? Again, there is a lot of debate about Western influence, influence of English, this and that. Is learning English making one part of that culture and making them more, uh, uh, you know, uh, more... Uh, prone to adopting the cultural practices of the speakers of that language that you are now learning. Again, a debate, uh, an open question. 
Finally, scientific evidence of this fact seems slightly difficult to get. How would you uh, probe my, uh, you know, my uh, psyche to discover that there are two different types of identities in me, if there are any, by the way? Uh, is there an English speaking Arkvarma or is there an Hindi speaking Arkvarma or are these two different people? How do you design tests? How do you design scientific, uh, you know, validation to sort of test and establish these kind of things? These remain anecdotal at best, uh, you know, as, as far as I am concerned. Now, Grosjean, for example, reported that sometimes bilinguals actually report that languages draw on the, their different languages draw out almost different personalities from them. And again, this is something uh, again anecdotal at best. But sometimes you feel that oh, when I am in my office, when I am in my workspace, when I am conversing to my students in English or my colleagues in English, I am speaking a little bit differently. Maybe my jokes are even different. Maybe the mannerism that I, uh, you know, display is a little bit different as compared to when I'm at home and speaking to my child and my family in Hindi. Is, is that, does that happen to you uh, as well? Have you experienced something like that as well? And is, is it again, and this is again a, a very interesting question that one can ponder about. Also group identities. When I speak Hindi, uh, I identify myself with a group of Hindi speakers. When I speak English, I probably identify with myself with a group of English speakers. Does it sort of uh, have a bearing on what do I see myself as, what kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, identity or self sense of identity do I have. So, this is a, these are some of the questions that are very, very interesting and we may, uh, uh, you know, at different points in time lean back on these questions to understand the bilinguals that we are going to be talking about, alright. So, uh, that's the end of this lecture. I'll see you in another one. Thank you.